before we start the show, we would like to thank our sponsors for 2024 Beef, Beef Master Education Endowment Fund. Uh, thank you for what you do for the breed, and thank you for supporting our show. SEBA, the Southeastern Beef Master Breeders Association. Uh, don't miss their convention and sale every August. Thank you for supporting the show. Emmons Ranch Beef Masters, Mr. Steve and Mrs. Cindy. They need no introduction. They always breed great cattle, and we just appreciate what you guys do, and thank you for supporting us. CNM Ranches out of Kershaw, South Carolina, the Chick family. Be on the lookout for their sale starting in 2025. Thank you for supporting the show. Lissy's Beef Masters so is another one that doesn't need any introduction. We appreciate what you do for uh, the breed and for our show. Cottage Farms Beef Masters, they have a sale with Clark Jones every year in June. Uh, thank you for supporting our show. Sea Shepherd Beef Masters, thank you for supporting the show out there in Texas. And Jones Beef Masters, uh, last but certainly not least, sell every June. They sell throughout the year. Mr. Clark, thank you for what you do for the breed. Uh, every day and thank you for what you do for our show jcs beef masters jared and kelly strickland out of savannah tennessee always raising great stock uh, thank you for what you do for the show and be on the lookout for their cattle and coming sales this year lastly gnm cattle company out of taylorsville north carolina family owned and operated uh, will be in multiple sales this year as well thank you to all of our sponsors we couldn't do it without you Welcome in to Beefmaster Banner. We're your hosts, Josh Morrison and Jared Strickland. How's it going, Jared? Uh, it's going good. It's been busy. I'm ready for a slowdown, but we ain't got time for that yet, do we? No, no. I know your uh I know your end's been busy. We're uh we like to normally record these pretty early and this one we're just about uh well, right on time, I guess. <laughs> yeah, we cut we cut it close, especially with our travels we got coming up. It happens. It happens, but it'll be all right. We, uh, we always somehow make it work. So yeah, so far we're going to start to show off a little bit different tonight. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about these wildfires that are blazing through Texas right now. And the first thing we want to say is our thoughts and prayers are with everyone involved, everyone in the way, um, and all the men and women fighting, uh, the fire, uh, pray for their safety as well. It's just a bad deal. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, we were looking at it a while ago. I think they said it's already up to a million point three or something like that acres. Maybe not even half contained yet. I'm not sure. Looking at the latest news stories, but definitely a bad deal. Uh, like I said, we're, we're thoughts and prayers are going out with those fellows out there. And, uh, it's in big cattle country. So a lot of cattle is going to be affected. Uh, Kind of trying to round some numbers up, but hadn't really seen nothing definitive yet. I'm sure there probably won't be any numbers for some time, but it uh, looks like there's going to be several thousand head uh, affected by it, and obviously several several ranching families and communities that's going to have a long road ahead to, to, to recover. Absolutely, absolutely. And, I mean, the wind, you know, it seems like the wind blows out there 24-7, and, and they're in a drought, too, and looks like it's trying to spread into – parts of western oklahoma um just uh brings brings things back to perspective a little bit sometimes when when we see something like that that you know we, we get some forest fires uh up towards the mountains this area but it's never you know i think the lord has never been anything like that yeah i think uh you know it's a it's definitely a force to that you can't control uh once it gets going it's uh, it's kind of it's definitely scary i could imagine I, I couldn't imagine how bad it is when when you wake up one day and next thing you know everything you got's up in blaze so absolutely absolutely and it engulfs things so fast that you know you you just try to get yourself out of there and your family and and everything else can be rebuilt yeah the um the impact on the cattle <clears throat> You know, we, we were talking about that a little bit ago, too. And I mean, I, I don't know. I guess no one can really guess what kind of impact this is going to have. I mean, we're still we're at the lowest herd in history currently. I think you said about 28 million head. So, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I, it's, 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 it's low. You know, it's going to, I mean, it's going to affect it. I don't know that it's going to affect it 
our way, but I think it will out that way for sure. Yeah, I mean, it'll depend on uh, what the numbers are on the death loss. I think something that we have to think about, uh, unfortunately for the the folks that have the cattle, uh, that landscape out there, like I said, I'm not uh, familiar with it as far as knowing it well. Uh, I'm sure there'll be others out there that, that'll talk about it, chime in, but it's kind of not like here in the southeast where you get a spring rain and after a fire or something, it's just going to green right back up and you go have cows grazing in just a month or two. I think it's a little bit longer term uh, <clears throat> a recovery for them. So even if they are cattle that obviously there'll be a lot of cattle survive it. I mean, you're talking about a million something acres. The ones that survive the, you know, I know there's a lot of donations going out for the, for the hay and things like that, but it's going to take a lot to feed those cattle. The country is short on hay really anyway. And, and uh, from the droughts the last couple of years. And I think the longer lasting effect of it will be how quickly will they be able to recover with the cattle they got or will they have to haul them to market, you know, or will they be able to find somewhere else in the country to hold them up for a little while until they can recover. So, you know, the death part of it is not really the, you know, even if it's 10,000 head, which would be an extreme amount of cattle too. But, you know, the longer effect would be the, the thousands of cattle that are still alive with the owners be able to keep feeding them till they get recovered or is there a place for them to go and stuff like that. So, uh, time will tell obviously, but yeah, it can have an effect on the market. Even anything right now that keeps holding the, keeps moving the cattle number down and, and stuff like that, it's going to, going to affect the market. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you know, I've been out, I've never been to the panhandle of Texas, but I've been about, 20 or 30 miles from the texas panhandle line and it's in amazing what those cattle survive on them there's nothing other than food plots things like that 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 the guys that we go out to every year we, out, we go deer hunting out there and you know they'll plant them they'll plant like these food plots uh to give them some something to eat uh but just some of these weeds they just look like weeds so i'd spray them if they were here um, they talk about how high in protein and fat they are and that they're actually surviving off that. I mean, I don't know how much grass would be on further West into the panhandle, but it can't be much. It, it's really impressive at how those cattle survive in the first place out there. Well, that's, that's kind of go back to the issue of the recovery time is those plants that they normally forage on out there, you know, it's all burned up now and it may take them a while to get back to the to the stage of where the cattle can forage you know enough to, to survive or or and all that so that's that's going to be probably the issue with that is how long does it take for that to that growth to come back you know even though it was dried up and and uh not growing or, or whatever they were still using it as forage you know so right um uh, right. now that it's there's nothing there but dirt so it's going to be it's going to be a an issue like i say we hope hope and pray that things recover quickly for them absolutely they get the fires out and they can they can start recovering speaking of other things that have to do with um the cattle market something that we really don't see a whole side of you see i feel sure you see your your share of it since you're on the extension but you know politics we, we just come through this primary season and and no matter your politics, it, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day because it, it really does affect the cattle market. Um, what do you see when it comes to that? Well, I mean, I think, you know, the, oh, all the, the macroeconomics is going to affect it, obviously, and how good is the consumer, how, uh, how much cash they got to spend. Everybody has to eat, but they can always eat something that don't cost as much money. Uh, and beef, obviously, looking at prices and everything, beef's kind of turning into a luxury item at the moment, you know. Uh, so that's that's something to think about. Uh, and, and, you know, politics and policies can affect that. Uh, we're all seeing that. And not to get too deep into politics, but, uh, you know, that's something that'll definitely affect the cattle market. I think, you know, I'm, 
kind of what brought this on because we were talking earlier you know i spent the last few days uh in uh nashville at our state legislator doing visits with uh farm bureau and and things like that and visiting legislators and and uh one thing that kind of stuck out to me is everybody's kind of got their own agenda up there and they're all trying to get with the right people to get their laws passed and and nothing wrong with that because i mean that's 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 how it's done uh so and like i was telling josh you know when he's talking about it when he's asking about my trip you know the squeaky wheel gets the grease a lot of times and and another guy told me up there too he was talking and and he was kind of joking but in the same time he was being truthful about it is if you're not at the table you're on the table and uh so if you're not sitting at the table for dinner you might be dinner so um and that goes with agriculture because a lot of our pol politicians or uh, representatives, however you want to call them, I mean, they're, they may not come from an agriculture background, so they may not know which bills will have a unintended consequence or even a purposeful con consequence on agriculture. And uh, I encourage folks to get involved. I know it takes time and, and effort, but, uh, you know, I was kind of, my eyes were kind of opened up, I, which I've been several times up there, but this one was a little bit more involved than I usually, usually do. And, uh, and kind of seeing how it works and some of the bills we set in on and and talked with legislators about you know trying to convince them why this may be a, a bad idea or a good idea um you know overall they're still having to overlook the politics of even the federal type government you know as far as things that they don't want to have a bad look or bad timing and stuff like that and there could be unintended consequences of the way they vote. You know, one we we were really looking at that uh, we thought was uh, you don't think about it being because people don't know that it's going on. But there were some counties in the in the state looking to try to stop uh, you know what biosolids being used in farming, which would be like chicken litter, uh, different things like that, and they was trying to get it passed through the subcommittee. To, to to get it on the get it on the house floor and and if uh, we're not there to tell them no this is a bad idea uh it could happen you know so that's one thing i learned about farm bureau and and to be active in your uh membership with stuff like that because they're there lobbying for you and in, in your interest you know uh sometimes you don't always 100 percent agree with what what they got and who and then there's never 100 percent agreement in anything but uh they're 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 there sticking their neck out for us and i was glad to see that and, and there's some other things that happened that were kind of disappointing and and uh when you listen to those uh legislators and representatives talk amongst themselves you know it really shows you the disconnect that they have and 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 that's with anything i can't get up there and if i was a uh, someone and trying to make a decision because they're they're making decisions across so many different industries, so many different things, you know, like healthcare, transportation, all these things. And so they got to become an expert real quick on something when it gets handed in front of them. And uh, so I can see the difficulty of it, but at the same time, uh, if there's nobody there to help them know which way to vote, you know, uh, they're going to vote with whoever's probably asking to get it done so absolutely that's just well, that's just my kind of take on it so i didn't want to get long-winded there but no no anyway. i mean it, it's important to talk about because we as cattle producers we're, we're here in the real world and we forget how how many people out there and how many politicians want the beef industry to to just crash they're they don't want beef they don't like cattle they don't or they love cattle they don't want them slaughtered at the end of the day, you know, it goes back to what you said, the squeaky wheel gets the cheese. We've got to, you know, who's going to, who, who's going to talk the loudest and going back to a couple of weeks ago, we were at the North Carolina cattlemen's uh, conference here locally. And, uh, they have the conference here in, uh, County right below us. And I, I go to it every year and the head of the NCBA was talking and he was got to talking about the beyond meat um, programs. And, you know, we, we've won the battle because, you know, he got to talking back in 2019 beyond me on the stock market was going for 200, right at $234 and 90 cents a share. As of today, it's at $8 a share. 
So what he's saying is, you know, legislators have realized that, you know, this, this is not going to work. This whole green initiative stuff, that's not going to work. It's just not, I mean, it, it, no matter how you look at it and, and as cattle producers, we've got to stand up for it. And that's a battle that we won, but there are a lot of other battles that, that are still yet to be won. And that just proves that over the last four years, people choose real beef and, and they called it goop. And that was probably a good word for it. Uh, <laughs> because you know, all they're doing, and I didn't realize, I mean, they're taking a sale of an animal and putting it in this radio actor or, or I think that's what they call reactor or something. And, and it's growing, it's growing more sales and it's turned, you know, that's what, that's what people are eating. And, and you can't convince me that that is good for you. It, you just can't. I mean, well, and, I, and you bring up a good point about that. I mean, we have to protect ourselves as beef producers. Uh, you know, they're kind of, that's a different product than what we produce. But yet we got to make sure that they don't label it the same way. And that way the consumer understands that this is different. You know, I think most of them do, but yeah, well, you know, things, and, change, things change over time. So if they don't, you know, you think you wouldn't think that there would be that big a disconnect right now between when people go to the grocery store to get their food. There's a lot of people that don't know really how it gets there. They just no. know that it's there, you know. So, and you know, they were talking about how the FDA uh, is who has been controlling the fake meat, and you know, do you may see them once a once a month. You may not see them, but once a year for them to look at what you're doing. Well, when the USDA is in there and correct me if I'm wrong, but they're in, if, if it's a processing plant, there's somebody from the USDA in there every single day, all day, keeping a check on the quality and everything. And, you know, they're not, they wasn't, we're not having to have, um, to put their ingredients on there. And that's the battle that they're trying to win now is show us your ingredients and we'll show you ours. Yeah, I mean, and you're right. I mean, a USDA processing plant has an inspector either on site or however they they do a lot of that. You know, every carcass is graded and and stuff like that. And I'm not real sure how the the uh, cell culture stuff is regulated to the point of inspection for every. I mean, who knows? Every barrel that's made, I don't really know how they make it as far as. <laughs> I mean, do they make it in a vat or when they get it, put it together and process it? I don't know, but I can tell you, I don't uh, know it. Especially some of that. Uh, now that they got the 3d printed type stuff. I don't know, man, that sounds strange, but anyway, yeah, yeah. you just, just eat what God gave you to eat. And that's the beef that, uh, that we're raising and, and putting on your table. Well, one thing I think, you know, that is helping us as beef producers too, is the U S consumer for sure. Even, export markets want a quality product why do you think we have so much emphasis on carcass quality in our breed all the other breeds and all this is because it's a we need a car quality carcass to give a quality product and it's just going to be really hard for a while I'm, I'm not saying they can't figure out how to do it but to make that same product as a god born given cow that we've absolutely been doing for years i mean it, you know they're having to they're going to have to try to replicate that synthetically and it's going to be it'll be hard uh i can see that um you know that's the kind of the the reason why they're going to that 3d printed stuff is they're trying to get the texture right and you know that's that's a big thing so um uh, it'll be interesting to see how it, it plays out uh, but as long as we have educated consumers, we'll probably win the battle for a, for a good while. Absolutely. At least I hope. I agree. I, I think so. I, th I think you're right. And, and that's what this is about. I mean, you know, people, some, maybe, maybe people wonder why we're at, we have such a push on carcass. Well, this is why we, we've got to up our quality, not only for the consumer, but we've got to keep up with the other breeds as well. I mean, we don't want them getting ahead of us or, or getting further ahead of us, we need to, we need to figure out how to make that work. And, and this is why, because we're, you know, we're fighting, we're fighting the fake meat brands and all this. And, and it's the better we can make our quality and our carcasses, the better off we're going to be. Mm -hmm. Yep. And 
this kind of you want to move into our question yeah yeah we we finally got to our i guess our main subject for the night i kind of i could talk all day with that so yeah well, um, it might be a long one <laughs> <laughs> so we had a question posed on facebook uh back when we were asking i think it was back in december and it was how do you get started with a small herd in this breed with 10 head or less and it's kind of a loaded question i think i think it's a little bit hard to answer um, but we're going to tackle it and see, see what we can figure out. I mean, the, the first thing I'm going to say is what is the average herd size in the United States? Is it 10 or 20? Uh, I'd have to look back. I don't think it's over 30. It's probably closer to 20, but that's when you take the average, you know, that's kind of skewed a little bit. So the average, if the average is 30, you know, you've got ranches with thousands Sure. that. Sure. So we'll bring it down. So. I don't I mean, know what the median median would be. I bet it, it's pretty small. I would say, I would say. I mean, my my opinion, and and this goes back to uh, one of our episodes last year with Mister Steve and Miss Cindy Evans. Find your best. If that's all you've got, let's just let's call it five head. If you've got five head of cows and you bought the best five head of cows you could find, flush. Find the absolute best one and flush her, flush her, flush her, flush her. And as long as that's going to be your quickest way to get the cattle you want um, and to get to where you're selling some cows. Now, it's a hero or zero when you're put, getting them put in. I mean, it, it's there's there's never a – I feel like there's never a middle ground. I mean, it, it's either, man, I did great or, man, I did not do good at all. Yeah, the kind of way I look at the question is, I guess the question was how to get started right with a small herd. So I guess they're not really limiting yourself to growing a herd. Uh, but if you're starting with a small herd, uh, quality is probably going to be one of your biggest issues to look at because since you, let's say you have five, let's say you start with 10 cows. Uh, at best, you're going to get 10 calves a year, right, out of those cows. So I'm thinking about it from a natural breeding standpoint. So your cows are going to be really important because you don't have that many calves to market. And then like anything, to get to make a market, uh, you got to kind of have some volume to some ex ex extent, I guess, but not necessarily. Uh, so that would kind of lead me to the point, if you if you're small – you really need to know what kind of market you have uh, or at least what you're targeting. Are you going to target show cattle? Are you trying to target other, other registered breeders? Or are you targeting commercial breeders? That could be heifers or bulls. Uh, that would be something that I would recommend that you figure out kind of in the get-go because that's going to determine the quality of cattle that you're going to have to have. If you're going to market towards show stock you're going to have to have really top-notch cattle uh, the better cattle always is better anyway but that's something to think about and going back to josh's point if you are not limited and wanting to grow your herd uh, the flushing deal is probably an idea but obviously you're going to need a good cow a good cow that's uh, been proven that way you know, you're just not getting a bunch of calves that may not be that good. Uh, I kind of tell you our experience with that. Uh, I kind of learned it from my dad. So we were kind of limited uh, when I was younger, when he was in the breed on land size. So we couldn't have but, say, 10 cows. But he had two donor cows that he flushed pretty regularly. He got them from Clark Jones, and they were really good cows, proven cows, and uh, flushed them pretty pretty regularly use a calf raiser and then we used the the land that we had to to you know uh raise those cattle from weaned into sale size and then we did keep a few here and there but mostly marketed them uh we would still market even out of those two cows we would probably market 20 ish calves a year uh, with that and did really well with it i mean um uh, so 
I would that say that to encourage you that you can you can find your market if even though your herd size is small. So don't let that stop you from trying or or anything like that because you can make it work. Uh, that would really be the way to make if you want to market more than 10 calves a year, obviously that would be something you'd have to do, but you can still do well marketing small amount of, of cattle. If you've got good cattle. I agree with that. And, and, you know, I think it'll go to, to say is before you ever buy your first cow, if you're a first generation, you just have love cows. You fall in love with the beef master breed. You say, Hey, I want to buy some cows. That's, where I don't want to say people mess up, but, but maybe kind of a little bit is they'll just run out here and buy just stuff. And instead of doing some research and knowing your market, I mean, that's going to be your, like, just like Jared said, that's, that's your biggest thing is before you ever buy your first cow, you need to know what your market is and you need to go to probably go to some sales and do some research to figure out exactly what you want to buy because it's expensive getting in this. I mean, it, it's, it's expensive to buy one cow, let alone 10 or 20 or 30 plus. I mean, it, it's, so you want to make sure whatever you're buying is most likely going to work with, you know, with whatever market you've got because all markets are different. Yeah. And, and not to bait it with a dead horse again, but <clears throat> Let's say, I mean, if you've only got room for 10 cows, let's say you are limited. We can bring it back to this. If you're limited, let's say 10 cows is my max. And that's all the room I have. Uh, I want to be able to market 10 cows a year. Well, you're going to really have to focus on quality more than most because you've only got room for 10, right? So you don't want 10 average cows you because you may have 10 average calves. So that, that kind of limits that may limit you as well. Cause if you have half bulls and half heifers, um, uh, you know, the bulls might be hard to market because your, your calves are only mediocre or, or a little around average, you know? So, uh, that really cuts into your revenue too, uh, as a registered breeder, cause obviously registered cows are more expensive. So, uh, I, I would suggest if, it, if I was starting over and I only had 10 cows, I would try to buy, the best 10 cows for the money that I could uh, just because you know that's one reason why commercial producers are typically more than you know they got a quite a, if they're going to do really well with it they got to have several cows because the margins are pretty tight uh, so to make the most of your margin with the 10 cows you need high quality stock that you can sell for a premium that's absolutely. the way I look at it absolutely and and you don't have as much for, you don't have near as much room for error as somebody with 50 head of cows. Yeah. I mean, you, you got you 50 head of cow. You, you can call half of them and still, you know, you still got 20 something head of cattle that. Right. That can, right. can market. So. so just be careful. I mean, I think that's kind of where, where we're going with that is just be careful, do your research and figure out what you want, you know, as far as, um, what you can sell, get in, try to get in a sale somewhere. Um, there's plenty of consignment sales, which takes me to my next point. Uh, get involved in the breed R right away. Start going to meetings, start going to join your satellite. Satellites are so important because there you can network with a ton of people in your area and your region, and you can get a better feel for what cattle people are selling in your region. Um, get involved in, in the breed itself. Uh, as far as committee meetings, those are open to the public come to the conventions, get involved the quicker, the quicker and more you can get involved, the better off you're going to be with a small herd because you're going to get in there and you're going to talk to guys that's got hundreds of head of cows. You're going to talk to guys that's got 20 head of cows. You're going to talk to people that's got 10 head just like you, or maybe less, but you're going to learn real quick. What is really good and what maybe will not work for you. Uh, you bring up a good point about getting involved with groups, satellites, et cetera. So you got to think going back to the, 
to 10 head questions or less. Uh, you're going to have a hard time marketing when you only have that many. So if you're in a group, say a marketing group, uh, satellite, et cetera, you can kind of plug into that marketing that's already being done for you. Because uh, let's say you've got a few heifers that you want to market. You can try to market them from the farm. That's that's a good idea. But maybe to get the exposure that you need, maybe you need to be in with a group. Say, let's use where we're with Seba, for example. You can take those there, get exposed to lots of other breeders that may not know you exist. Uh, and like Josh says, you're networking and getting to know people. But also... You know, obviously there's sales expense and et cetera to do that. So it does cost more money than selling them off the farm. But at the same time, you're getting exposed to clientele that you may not know that exists or they may not know you exist. And then those sales could have been around. Most of them have been around for a while. So you're already drawing a crowd and, and leverage their marketing that they're already doing for yourself and for your farm. Yeah, absolutely. And, I just think that's, we've got to keep pushing satellites. I think that's the best, just, I, I just feel like that's the best way for new and old breeders alike to, to get there and to keep up with people in the region. I, I, it's just, it's just the best way to do it. And I'm glad that we've got Seba on the Southeastern part. Um, and there's some other ones that I'm going to join and, and try to make it to those are further away, but it's just more people to market to. It, and, and this is another Facebook question and it kind of goes with tonight's subject. So we decided to put them in together. The, the question was posed. What is more important bull buying a really good bull or buying some really good cows? I feel like you have, you ask a hundred different people that question and you're going to get a hundred different answers. 100 percent that's a tricky one and uh i can see right now we're not gonna make everybody happy with that answer <laughs> no <laughs> we can we'll try to give... the, we can give our opinion and then go from there and i'll be honest with you um i think both are important obviously but it really depends on your goals and your operation uh i've always thought the cow is more important because if, it, if the cows, even though, all right, let's walk through this, I guess. Along with it, but. <laughs> the bull does cover your cows, right? So he affects every calf. Correct. Yes. So that makes the bull important. But if you put a bull on a bunch of sorry cows, you're probably still going to have a bunch of sorry calves, or they might be slightly better. Uh well, if they don't so, milk, I mean, take milking, for instance, if the cow don't milk good, that calf's never going to grow to its potential. Yeah. So I, I lean to more on the female side of things because, yeah, I've, I mean, I've had cows that are kind of mediocre and upgraded them with a good bull, but it seems like I've always gotten burnt down the line with those cows because something with those cows showed up in their offspring that the bull just couldn't quite cover up one for you may example for, for milk and ability, but typically like the udder or something like that, bad feet, whatever you want to call it. I think if you have good fertile cows that are, have the thickness to them, have the structure that you need, really you're set up to do well because that way, uh, you just got to have a bull and hopefully not mess them up too bad, I guess. I don't know. What, <laughs> I, that's that's still a tough question. I, I mean, realistically, the answer would be have the best cows and the best bull you can have. But money dictates a lot of things. Uh, it costs more money to have. Let's say you got to have, let's say if we go back to the 10 cow example, I mean, you got to buy 10 cows. Well, you can't go buy, it'd be hard to buy 10, $20,000 cows, right? It'd be easier to buy I'm expensive bull and some average cows, but I don't know. That that's a tough question. I I think really? it really depends on really depends on your goal too. But 
we're gonna uh, get in trouble regardless of what answer yeah we get. i, I see ahead. that you know. i can i can i'm i'm picturing people talking about it right now uh, <laughs> as long as we're no, talking that's all it matters though but i would worry about the cows first uh just because you got to have them to be fertile they got to have good udders you got to have good feet and legs and and things like that and then try to if you're limited on budget try to find the bull that will keep you in the game yes so a couple months ago somebody joked with me about how they were and they this was just a lighthearted joke they said man you need a different co-host or something because y'all need to disagree on something because <laughs> we never you know we have the same philosophies you know we're pretty much best friends we we have the same pretty much the same thoughts on everything and, and we're in the same region which which helps but I agree with you. I can't disagree with that. I mean, I, I was trying to think of a way to, to rebuttal that, but I agree 1,000%. Bulls are very important. But just like you said, the cow is, you know, good or bad traits, the cow's going to pass those along. The bull will too, but we're a maternal breed, and we're trying to yeah. make it more of a maternal breed. And that right there tells you we are focused on cows and the female um i like what you said just finding a bull that don't mess you up or don't take you backwards um and there's a lot of those out there there's i think it's a lot easier to find a really good cleanup bull reasonably priced versus trying to find that superstar um once in a lifetime bull because they're they're not a ton of so in that case just utilize ai or yeah. embryo transfer or whatever and and let your bull your really good cleanup bull clean them up and you're still kind of hitting best the best of both worlds yeah I, I agree with that you brought up a good point with the ai thing uh because you can get a hold of really good bulls for a lot much money i mean so if you utilize the ai of course but <clears throat> if you got 10 cows i definitely recommend you doing that i mean that's that would be a way to keep you with some high performance cattle as well. But so that goes back to maybe we're right about the cow is more important. I don't know. <laughs> maybe, maybe Somebody's more to let us know. Maybe more efficiently because I mean, like I said, the cat, you got to have the cow to have the calf and, and, uh, they're going to dict. I mean, just from my experience over time, We've had cows. You gotta have a cow ten years, and she's gonna be bred to multiple bulls, right? If that cow can have a good calf with four or five different bulls, those are the kind of cows you need to be keeping or replacing out of. If you got one that you that's like, well, this bull worked, but this bull didn't work, and and this and that, it's really hard to match a bull to all your cows if they're like that. If you've got good consistent cows across the board, the cow can kind of carry you if but like i said if you're utilizing ai you may be be the cheapest way to 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 use good bull genetics but you still got to have the good cows i agree so there's your answer but what you think about it (laughs) but you think about it how many of the folks we've had on this podcast in the last couple years and there's a few stick out of my mind but you know that's something that they talk about is it's about the cow family. And here we go talking about cow families again, but there's a reason why they've been successful using cow families is because it's about the cow. Absolutely. I have 100%. I mean, and, and if you've got a different opinion out there, we're all ears. We, we, we're fine with, we're, we're not saying you're right or wrong. It's just our opinion. And yeah. that's what I love about this thing is we can give our opinion. <clears throat> I'd like to see some discussion on it once we post it out. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm hoping we do get some pretty we'll, good discussion. We'll uh, we'll be out. Well, we'll be on the road tomorrow, but when it comes out Friday, we'll be at the elite sale. Well, so we we'll either be ducking because people's going to be throwing stuff at us, or <laughs> or uh, or vice versa. We'll see. Yeah, I'm interested uh, in seeing how the discussion goes as for at the sale. <laughs> I, I'm excited to hear everybody's opinion. That's just our opinion. You know that we we're on here every two weeks, and that's just what we do. We just give our opinions, and we're not trying to sway you one way or the other. Uh, we just try to answer the questions the best we can, and and 
I'm with you. I, I wanted, I really, I truly, truly wanted to disagree with you somehow, some way right there, but I couldn't. I just, there was just no way. Well, you can sometimes. <laughs> I'm sure we'll get to it. Now, we got several more questions on the list, so we're going to get to it at some point. Yeah, yeah, we'll get there. But uh, good episode tonight. We uh, kind of covered a lot in a short period of time. So if there's something that, that you want to hear more of, let us know, especially on this episode. Um, if you see us this weekend, we'll be at the Cattleman's Elite Sale. Uh, be sure to stop us and, and let us know what you think about the podcast. Um, if not, we'll see everybody on the next episode. All righty. See you. Well, we want to thank everybody for listening to the Beefmaster Banner podcast. Uh, please know that we are on Apple Podcast, Spotify, and we are on YouTube. Just search Beefmaster Banner. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe. We love hearing from you, um, and we'll see you on the next episode. Thank you.